Grab your Bibles. Uh, let's go to our word this morning, Matthew chapter 18. Just a couple of things I want to share with you. I want to pick up a little bit of where we left off on last week um, to kind of move and uh, speak to what God is saying. So Matthew chapter 18, and then um, jump down to, I think it's around verse 21. Yeah, we're going to talk there um, just briefly to share a few things from the passage of Scripture. We've been dealing with the issue of what it means to live in the kingdom of God, and I want to pick up and walk through um, that. Here, before we read that, um, look up with me at the screen. Here's where we were last week. Let me just give you a little bit of review. From last week, we went to the book of Romans chapter 17, I mean chapter 12, verse 17 to 21, and we spoke a little bit about overcoming evil with good. And what we've been doing, in case you're visiting or just have been sporadic, missing here and there, we've been talking about the impact of what it means to reestablish God's kingdom here on earth. And then we've moved to the place where we're talking about kingdom principles. If I'm a kingdom subject and I'm living in God's kingdom, what does that look like? What does that mean, right? What is that all about? And so last week we talked about the whole issue of overcoming evil with good in Romans chapter 12 where it says don't give anyone evil with evil, you know, leave that because vengeance belongs to the Lord. And the big idea that we shared was this, vengeance belongs to God, therefore we do not retaliate against your enemy, instead we overcome evil with good because all of this belongs to God. And, and the big thing that we shared by way of an illustration uh, last week was we talked about the story of... Um, of, of the shooting that happened in South Carolina um, in 2015 and how it was that Dylan Roof walked into this Emmanuel AME church and um, participated actively in these individuals' worship and Bible study, then at the end pull out a gun and shoot the pe shot the people that were in attendance such that nine individuals lost their lives. And what we looked at as we told about that story at the end of the message, we talked about the response, and I just want to read these again, um, because here's what Anthony Thompson, whose wife was shot by uh, Dylan in the church shooting, here's what she said when Dylan was facing that judge roughly a few days. This is very, very shortly after the shooting happened. I believe it was two days. She said, I forgive you. My family forgives you, but we would like for you to take this opportunity to repent and change your ways. They were able to forgive. And here's what I've been saying about that. In that moment, you never know what you're going to do. Can we be honest, people? It's one thing to be taught forgiveness. It's one thing to be taught to love your enemy and love your neighbor. But in that moment, you never know what you're going to do. Is that fair? And so, but here's how these people responded. And here's another family um, where Wanda Simons, or Simmons, she was the granddaughter of one of the person who was murdered, Daniel Simmons. She says, although my grandfather and the other victims died at the hands of hate, this is proof that everyone's plea for your soul is proof they lived in love and their legacies will live in love. And this person, Wanda, was able to say, hate will not win. And I gave you two quotes last week, and I want to put those on the screen again briefly. Um, MLK, Dr. Martin Luther King, here's what he says, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that, right? Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And then the great commentator, F.F. Bruce, here's what Dr. Bruce says. The best way to get rid of an enemy is to turn them into what? Oh, amen. So I want to look at that this morning. I want to look at that. How does one turn an enemy into a friend? And how did these individuals at that Emmanuel AME church get to the place where they could forgive. They knew something about the Word of God, right? That, that we have to get to that place uh, to get to where we need to go. I'll tell you, this is a two-second story. Uh, I shared that message last week, and remember, the, I jokingly said to you all, if somebody hits your car in the back, turn it around, let them hit in the front. Well, Monday, guess what happened to me, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I tried my best to behave like the people at Emmanuel. Um, no, I did <laughs> I did. It's, it's so funny. The, fun, the first thing when that happened, the Lord quietly spoke to my spirit and says, now you got to turn your car around. You know? 
But it worked out well. Uh, myself and the person who hit me, God just worked it out. We just end up being good friends. And God, you know, you keep the peace, right? Because there's nothing you can do in that. But God taught me a valuable lesson in that. And so, um, so I want us to look at this text, about a passage of Scripture, to talk about the issue of forgiveness. I want to talk about forgiveness. So turn to your and say, neighbor, today we're going to talk about what it means to forgive and live again. Say the other neighbor. Today we're going to talk about what it means to forgive and to live again. So let's pray. We're going to read and I'm going to talk quick. Just I want to share five simple things with you. Sounds like a lot, but I'm going to let the text speak. Father, we open our hearts to hear, open our hearts to be in tune, open our hearts to be about you. So as we go to your word, God, you speak, you move, you have your way because forgiveness truly is difficult and challenging. So we want to learn. We want to see what your word says. We want to hear from scripture. And if we're going to be kingdom subjects, God, teach us how to walk that out and how to be about your father's business. So open my heart. Um, Felix moves out of the way and give you room to speak. Open all of our hearts to hear and to receive and to most importantly reflect for ourselves. Self-evaluate so the world can be a better place because of your church and your kingdom subjects. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen. And amen. I'm going to say this just by a brief way of introduction. Forgiveness is difficult, and it's a lot easier said than done. Can we be honest this morning, right? Because here's, here's, here's what we do, us spiritual people. We say, God and I got it worked out, and I forgive you. And then we say this crazy thing, but I don't have to tell you that I forgive you. Come on, y'all. And we do it in our head. We do it in our minds. We do it in our spirit. We do all that stuff but we don't want to engage the person. And I want to talk about some things because I'm one of those guys that's going to say forgiveness is very similar to the word love, right? It's an action word. That means that it requires some sort of an action to substantiate its validity, right? So here's what that means. If I say to my wife, baby, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And all I do is say, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, but there's no action to substantiate my love for her It doesn't matter how many times I say, I love you, I love you, I love you. At some point in time, she's going to say to me, you don't love me. And I can't say, but I told you I love you, because in her head, she's saying you never showed it. Does that make sense? No different than the word forgiveness. It does no good to say, I forgive you, 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 but then I hold you hostage, and I never release you, come on, y'all, from the wrong, right? Right? I'll forgive you, but when you come to church, you sit there, I'll go sit over there. Is that really forgiveness? Come on, let's talk about that, right? Is that what God did with you? Did God say to you, I forgive you for your sins, but I'm going to leave the world and leave you in it because I don't want to have nothing to do with you. (laughs) Now, he forgives us that he comes so close that he literally enters our hearts. Oh, my gosh. And he lives there with us. So here's what this text says. Let's walk through this. And I want to share something. Let me just look real quick on, because here's, I'm just going to put this up front and just kind of walk through this so you can kind of hear and see what it's saying, okay? I want you to take this big idea away from you. God's forgiveness toward us should be reflected in our forgiveness towards others. And here's all that means in English. The same way God engages with me when he forgives me, God's expectation is that I engage those who have wronged me the same way he engages me. Does that make sense? So if God can forgive me, I have an obligation to reciprocate or extend the forgiveness of God in that same manner to others. So let's move to the text in the interest of time, and let me just share what I'm going to share with you. Notice what verse, uh, chapter 18, let me read two verses, and then we're going to talk about this. Somehow, um, Jesus got through talking about, and let me give you literary context real quick, in verses 15 all the way to 19, where Jesus talks about if your brother sins against you, you go tell him your fault. If he listens, you've gained a brother. Verse 16 says, if he does not listen, um, then take one or two others along with you. Every charge should be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Verse 17 says, if they still refuse, then you tell it to the church. And if they don't, you treat them as a Gentile. And then verse 18 says, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound or loose, bound in heaven. What you loosen on earth should be loosened in heaven. And then look at 19. Again, I say, if two or three of you uh, touch and agree about anything, 
it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, he says, there am I in the midst. Now, Peter, being the vociferous or vocal individual that he is, he said, that sounds good, Jesus, right? But I have an issue with James and John, and I haven't released it less. I'm just giving you context. I'm not saying the text says this. Because they ask you that they want to be next to you in your kingdom, and I really wanted to be there, so I haven't released them from that yet. So I'll tell you what. He raises this issue, right? How many times do I forgive my brother if he sins against me? So look at the text. Here's the text picks up. After he heard that teaching, here's what he says in verses 21. Then Peter came to him and said to him, Lord, how often... Will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And then Peter answers his own question, right? Here's what he says. As many as seven times? Okay. Now, here's what you need to know about Peter's response. Rabbinically, the Jewish, the, the Jewish rabbis had this principle established in Judaism that when a person sins the same sin, you're allowed to give them grace three times, Right? That was the culture. That was what the culture dictated. That's what the culture said. So if I came and I offended you with the same thing, I, you should at least at a minimum, based on culture, history, and the teaching of the rabbis, you gave me three times to fail you. Three strikes, and then you're out. So Peter says, I'm going to transcend the rabbinical teachings, and I'm going to add four to it so I can look really good. So Jesus, here's what he's saying. I know the teaching says and the culture says I have three times to forgive them. So I'm going to be something because I've been walking with you for about a few years now, so I've learned some things, okay? So I've matured some. So should I do it seven times? And watch what Jesus said. <laughs> Jesus said to him, verse 22, I do not say, um, I do not say to you seven times, but he says what? 70, some of your translation says 70 times, seven times, right? So here's the principle that Jesus is trying to communicate. Peter, it's not, it's not a number. It's not that you do it this many times and quit. So don't waste time trying to figure out what the math in all of this is. The principle is as many times as it takes. Y'all not ready for that. No. Because you you've given up on somebody, you've done eight. Yeah, yeah you you did you one up Peter, <laughs> amen. Yeah, you you did eight, and you figure I'm good at eight, and some of us are saying, well, I'm at fifty, so I'm good because Jesus says forty nine, right? And the principle is not a number to say after you've done it this many times you stop. The principle is whatever it takes to restore the relationship is what God is after, right? Now, I don't know about you, um, I'm 15 years old, right? Um, a little older than that, but my point is, uh, point is I've been on the earth for a while. And because I've been on the earth for a while, I think if I were to try to enumerate the amount of times that I've sinned, and God forgave me, Amen. come on, can we be honest with ourselves? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm out of toes, I'm out of fingers, <laughs> I'm out of numbers, and, and I, I think I'm comfortable in saying, preacher, I'm not just talking about myself. I think somebody else in here can say the same thing. If you were to try to enumerate, come on, can we be honest this morning? The amount of times that we went to God to ask for forgiveness, matter of fact, because there's no number on it, here's what Jesus says in, um, in, in what is it, 1 John 1 and 9, that if we confess our sins, he's what? Faithful and just to do what? To forgive us for our sins and then to do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he erased the number for it. So because there's no number, he says, Peter, let me explain something to you and let me tell you how bad this is, right? And how far I am willing to go to restore the relationship so I can establish kingdom principles. So then he gives this parable. And so let me read the parable in its entirety and then we're going to talk about it. Let's talk about the story in its entirety. Here's what he says in verse 23. Therefore, he says, listen to this, Peter. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. 
And since he could not pay, don't miss those words, his masters ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment be made. So the servant fell on his knees and imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. He must have missed the part where the verse said he could not pay. Verse 27 says, and out of pity, come on, say out of pity for him. Everybody said again, say out of pity for him. The master of that servant released him, don't miss that word, released him, forgave the debt, and forgave the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who had owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, and he began to choke him, saying, boy, that sounds like us. Man, pay me what you owe. So the fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused and went and put him in prison until he could pay the debt. And when the fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to the master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me and should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I've had mercy on you? Interesting. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he could pay all the debt. So also, don't miss verse the last 35, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you, wow, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart, okay? So Jesus now uses this parable to kind of drive the point home with Peter to get him to understand what's going on. So I want to share, I want to share five things with you real quick. Here's, here's, um, here's before I even go into, here's what the word, uh, the definition for give, for, forgive mean, right? Is this interesting Greek word, aphiomi, and here's what it means to cancel the death. Come on, everybody say it. Say cancel the death. Yeah. Say it again. Say cancel the death. Yeah. One more time. Say cancel the death. Okay, um, Katani and I just recently, we, like I said, been living this whole debt-free thing. We paid off some bills. And here's the thing. When, when, when I get um, letters now from former debtors, I don't even open it. I just put it in a shredder. You know why? Yeah. Yeah, you get it. It's been canceled. I've got the deed to my vehicle, so whatever the thing is, so I don't position myself to be accessed, right? I don't even open it. I, I mean, I'm like, what's the point? What? I, it's been canceled, it's been paid, it's been done with. You kind of get what I'm saying, right? So I cancel it, and here's what it means now. To be excused, to excuse from a fault or offense, to pardon, to renounce anger or resentment against, to exonerate from payment of, to pardon from a prior obligation, which includes wrongdoing, scandalizing, or commitment that was made by another person to someone else. Because somebody else is still sitting here saying, oh, you don't know what they did. It's bad. I think your scenario is in that definition somewhere, and forgiveness means that a release ought to take place, and we ought to let people go. So here's the first thing I want y'all to get with me as we go through. The magnitude of forgiveness received from God should be the basis for the magnitude of forgiveness we give to others. So here's the thing. Pastor Vernon, it's not that I forgive you a little bit, and I'm going to wait to see what you do, then I'll forgive you some more, and I'll let some more time go by, and if you keep hitting yourself, I'll forgive you some more, and then maybe over time we can be friends again. Yeah. Are y'all not ready for this? No, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Based on a definition and based on what God has done for me, when he forgives me, he doesn't sit back. I'm going to see what you're going to do, bro. And if it get right, I'm going to be friends with you. No, 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 no. When he forgives us, the relationship, I wish I had somebody in here. The relationship never severs, right? Don't, don't you thank God for that? In, in other words, somehow he has the ability to deal with his emotions, to deal with his feelings, to deal with his anger, to deal with everything he gets against us instantaneously by virtue of the fact that I repent. And then he says, how he forgave me, that's the measure stick. If I'm a kingdom subject, (laughs) y'all go ahead and say, I should have stayed home. Come on, yeah. (laughs) That's the measuring stick that I now use interpersonally with my brother or sister for Christ. Why are you saying that, preacher? Because the same God that forgives me 
lives in me. And as a kingdom subject, my behavior should pattern that of the God that I serve. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, that's difficult. Come on, say it again. Say, that's difficult. Okay. <laughs> Look at the text real quick. He says, it's like the kingdom of heaven is like a, um, verse 20, 20, was that 23? Uh, man, uh, um, compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his service. And it says, when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him, and I love this, 10,000 talents. Now, just, just real quick, just real quick. A talent is a lot different than a denarii, right? A talent, one talent is the equivalent of 20 years of labor. Okay, back in that day and age. If you were to contemporize that and look at what gold is worth and what silver is worth, and you were to ask yourself in today's day and age, at least within this, 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 this time frame, what would this number be equivalent to? Some commentator says that if you do the numbers, this thing could be equivalent to $20 billion. I'm going to jail. Right? I, I, I think all us up in here, <laughs> we go to jail too. You kind of get to say, that's a huge debt, right? So this says that this man was probably no ordinarily common day laborer. He probably held a position of trust um, with the king where he was probably the manager of the bank account. Or he probably embezzled, funded, a whole lot of stuff. But somehow he found himself in a predicament where he was, I mean, it's going to take him a whole lot of lifetimes to be able to repay this debt, right? And if you look at the text, if you look real quick at what verse is that, verse 28, it says, and since he could not pay, I mean, Jesus is pointedly in saying it's not that he had the ability to repay it. He could not repay it. His mar his, here's what the, the master said. Let me go ahead and sell him and his wife and his children and all that he had so at least I can recover something right? And 26, here's what the servant did. He fell on his knees, implored him, have patience with me um, until, uh, and I will repay everything. And out of pity, the text says, come on, say out of pity. Say it again, say out of pity. His master of that servant released him. And then let me say this in English and cancel the debt. I want you to get the extreme here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you owe me $20 billion, I ain't canceling none. <laughs> You're going to come up with at least one of them billions, right? <laughs> I'm not, you're going to get what I'm saying. I, I, I'm not canceling nothing. But, but the principle of the text is this. The magnitude of the debt owed, the magnitude of the debt owed, and the ability, inability of the debtor to ever in an entire lifetime repay the debt. Man, doesn't that sound like me and doesn't that sound like you when it comes to our relationship with God and how sinful we were? This is why we, we were unable to pay, repay the debt of sin, but because of God's love, come on, he canceled it. He, and, and, and what I love about the cancellation of the debt is that he didn't find another person to get a loan from them. He took himself. Come on. He incarnated himself and then he releases me on the cross of Calvary for the debt that I owed him. That's amazing. So, and then here's what he says, based on how I forgave you, you now ought to get to the place where we give our lives for others so they can have a relationship with me. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Right? And then, and then, and then let, me, let me go here. Let, let me go here. Let me go here. And then it says, uh, out of pity, he released him, forgave him. And that same servant went out and he found a fellow who owed him 100 denarii. You got to be kidding me. Here's what a denarii is. One denarii is one day's work. This dude, one talent was 20 years worth of work, right? He could have waited 90 days, 100 days, yeah. due to have all the money to pay him back, right? One day's labor, and here's what he did. He went out to this dude after all that debt he was released from. <laughs> he seized him. Now, y'all got to get a picture. I'm going to do this to John because Pastor Katani hits back, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he grabbed the dude. Am I choking you yet? You got a big neck, dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then he started, give me my money. Give me my money. Give me my money. A hissy fit. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Choking the guy 
when he himself, just prior, was released from a $20 billion debt. Oh, my God. Let me go here. Baby, I forgive you for everything that I might have done, right? When I understand the magnitude of what God did for me, who am I to dare hold you? Oh, come on, for the little lie you told about me. Come on, for the little game that, come on, come on, come on. For the little things that you may have done when I was even more guilty because through the lens of God, the offense that I did toward him was a lot bigger than the thing I did to you and you did to me. And I dare accept his forgiveness and not give it to you. Oh my goodness. Who in the world? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, that's arrogance. Yeah, that's arrogance. That's arrogance. Now watch this. Let me keep going. Let me go because I'm running out of time. Let's go here real quick. And notice what the text says. Look okay? So the fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him. He's choking, so he pleaded. He says, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he refused and he went and put him in prison until he should do what? Pay the debt. You guys are seeing this? So here's the second thing I want you to take. And I'm just going to say this and let it speak for itself. Here's the thing. When we refuse to give people, forgive people, We subconsciously imprison them in our own minds, not theirs. Let me help y'all with that. I got more folk that's mad with me. And I don't know they're mad with me. And they can't even come to church because they're so mad. And here I am worshiping God. I haven't imprisoned them but they imprison themselves subconsciously in their own mind when they think they're putting you in jail. But they're the ones walking around with the problem, right? That's what happens when we refuse to forgive, right? If there's a person that, let's say, for example, that has wronged me and I refuse to forgive them and I don't have the gall or the spiritual wherewithal to go release that person or at least to share with them what I did, I am the idiot, excuse the term, walking around being mad while they're being free. So we may think we're holding them in prison, but really we're the ones. Come on, y'all. That's can we be honest this morning? That's imprisoning ourselves when they're free to come. You you kind of get what I'm saying? So this man thinking he's putting the dude in prison, but I just want to draw the parallel. We are the ones imprisoning ourselves when we hold people captive. Very, very, very important. Let me move. Let me move because I don't want to, I just want to draw these things. And it says, when, when the fellow servant saw what had happened, what had taken place, notice what it says here in verse 31, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Watch this. When the fellow servants, when the fellow servants saw what had taken place. Come on, say they saw him. Say it again. Say they saw him. Watch this real quick. Um, but, but before I even go here, this, this guy said this. this. This guy said this. He says, unforgiveness, y'all know that guy? It's like drinking poison expecting the other person. <laughs> That's good, isn't he? He ought to write a book about that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but I'm putting you in prison. I'm drinking poison. I'm going to wait for you to die. And I can't even go to church because you up in there. But I'm waiting for you to die. And you in there worshiping God. Come on. I, oh, I was going to go to the mall, but I saw her. Mm-mm, I'm not going to buy nothing no more. So I'm going to wear the same thing. I'm waiting for you to die while you shopping, enjoying life, going to the movies, enjoying. Come on, come on. Enjoying life. But here I am. I am the one dying. Yeah. Next thing, our unwillingness to forgive is not restricted to us and those we refuse to give. It impacts the who? Entire community. So let me tell you what this looks like. This is where gossip begins, right? I've got to tell everybody that I'm miserable. And this is what we do. We tell everybody we're miserable. These people saw, had he released this individual like God released him, it would have never made it to the community. I'm making a point here. When we don't release people, others find out about it, 
and it begins the part, the process of making us look crazy in the sight of God. Does that make sense? I'm going to hit this really quick, and then we're going to move on. We are painting a terrible picture of ourselves. Does this make sense? Is, is this making sense? I, I, I don't want to stay long. I just want to let the text speak, okay? So now watch this. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servants, verse 32 says, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And then he says, should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? One more time. You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? A couple more things real quick and then we're going to move on. Look at this real quick. Here's how God and why God calls us wicked. When we refuse to forgive others with the magnitude of forgiveness we receive from him. Let that speak. Let me go back. Pastor Byrne, I'm going to give you a little bit. And I'm going to wait to see how you're going to do before I forgive you some more. By virtue of the fact that I did the little bit, God begins the dialogue. You wicked Let me, let me go even better. Let me go better. Hey, man, I forgive you completely, but I ain't going to never forget what you did. Here's what God said. You wicked. Hey, man, all right, all right. I forgive you. I'm going to try to forget, but I'm going to lead a church because you still go there. And I'm out to see you. You wicked. what the text says, right? I'm not making this up. Here's what he says. It says here, then the master said, hey, come here, come here, come here. Let's talk about this. And he didn't even say, how you doing? He straight up said, you wicked, wicked servant. And here's the reason I'm calling you wicked. I forgave you. Yeah, you get it. I told you how deep that word all was last week, right? It's a deep Greek word, man. It just means all. Right? <laughs> I, I forgave you not some, not one or two things, but what? All. All. And look at why I did it. Simply because you asked. Mm. Oh, my gosh. It wasn't like you offered me payment. It wasn't like you negotiated, well, take my house or take my car. All you did was ask, and I freely forgave you. Just because you asked. And then he says this, look at the next word, and says, should you not now have had mercy on your fellow servant? Look at the basis, the same way I did it for you. It gets ugly, okay? This, this might challenge some of your theology real quick, because I wanted to put this out, and, and this, this is going to be ugly. This is going to be ugly. This is going to be ugly. You theologians might not be able to process this. So I need that back on the big screen. So God forgives and forgets. Okay? And the exclamation point meaning truth. Our refusal to forgive others as God forgave us, forgave us, reminds him of the sins that he already forgave us of, and it results in increased torture and reprimand. Let me, let me help you out with that. Well, let's read, let's read. And we can talk about that. In anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he could do what? pay all his debt. And then look at verse 35. So my heavenly father will do to who? Every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now, the reason I came up with that point and the reason I want to flesh this out, when the story opens, here's what he did. He pleaded with the master and he says, I know I owe you 20 billion plus dollars. Here's what the master says. It's all cool. You are forgiven. Go ahead and live life. The story goes on. He leaves the master's presence and he goes to somebody who owes him a small amount of money and he chokes him and he puts that person and death. Word got back to the master. And here's what the master said. Hey, remember that $20 billion I released from you? Your refusal to forgive that person caused me to remember something I had already forgotten. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would have never said to you 
Remember the debt I forgave you of had you not reminded the person, I wish I had somebody here, of what I did. Come on, what they didn't do for you. And so now, because you put me in this place of remembering something I'm not supposed, I wish I had somebody in here to remember, greater is the consequence. The depth of this, the depth of this, the depth of this. If we're going to be kingdom subject and play with God's memory like that to cause him to go back into places he's already released us from. We can flesh that out. We can talk about that. We can, some of y'all. we can talk about that. We can talk about that. But it's in the text. So Peter, if you don't do it that eighth time, my mind's going to go places. Because that's not the expectation. The expectation is, in the kingdom, we forgive and we act like God. Because when you don't act like me and you start perpetrating, I'm going to show up and tell you who you really are. Patrick, I forgive you, bro. I'm going to release everything because when I stand before God, all I want to see on that screen is covered by the blood. That's all I want to see. Are you with me? When I stand before that throne, I just want to see covered by the blood because I have sense enough to realize if it doesn't say covered by the blood, he's saying something else. Depart from me, you wicked. I wish I had somebody. Yeah, yeah. And here's what you're going to say. But God, I was on the worship team. Come on. But God, I was on the usher board. But God, I was a deacon. But God, he's going to say, depart from me. I never know you because those who know me, well, let me say it differently. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them and I follow them. You see the challenge of what it means to live a kingdom life? So this is why Peter says, man, this is difficult. I don't know if I can do this. And Jesus says, this word is not for everybody. (sighs) Come on, worship. Let me just a couple of scriptures. This one is hard. If we forgive our debtors, Matthew 8, 6, we will also have forgiven our debtors, as we have also forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into them. No, I'm sorry. Forgive us our debt, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Look at verse 14. If we forgive others their trespasses, your Father will do what? Also forgive you. If you do not forgive others, it's in there. It's there. It's there. That's just one. It's another one. It's all over the place. When of you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. Why? So that your Father who is in heaven may do what? Yeah. It's there. It's there. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted to one another, forgiven one another. How? As Christ has also forgiven you. And here's one. Bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so must you also forgive. Here's the altar call this morning. When you guys, did you get a card or something when you came in? You guys got that? Everybody got one of those? Yeah, good. (laughs) Grab a pen. And some of y'all might want to lean over the card in case you got to write the person that's sitting next to you's name. Yeah. <laughs> so they don't see, that's my name. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. yeah, if you need more paper, we have more in the back, yeah. We're going to release this morning. We're going to release. We're going to release. If you think there's at least one name, I want you to write the name before we pray. If there's multiple, you just write it. You just write it. This is what kingdom is all about. And I'm not asking you to write the name of the person who has wronged you. I'm asking us to self-evaluate. Who is it? Lord, is there one? Is there? I mean, even if that person has said wrong things about you, write their name. I remember when I was walking through this process, 
my mentors, um, I had some issues for the former ministry that I left. My mentor said to me, Felix, you got to go back to that church and you got to call a church meeting beginning with the elders and apologize to everybody. And here's me, right? But I ain't done nothing. It ain't matter. You just don't know who you offended. Go back. I, I did. I had to call everybody together because they understood the principles that we're talking about and because I understood it. You kind of get what I'm saying? Most difficult thing to do, but I wanted to be free in God. And I want to challenge you today. Let's get out of prison today. Let's get out of prison, right? Let's get out of the prisons of our mind. Let's get out of the places of captivity. Let's stop causing God to remember what he released us from. <sighs> Write your name and then I'm going to pray. And Pastor Katani, after you do all that you've done, here's what we're going to do. Um, ushers, I'm going to need one of y'all to have a basket on both sides of this thing when you get a chance. And then I want you to come and make sure your card is face down, please. And we can invite you to place those at the altar. And we're going to cover those things in prayer. But you coming up saying it's release, it's release. I'm, I'm letting you go. I'm letting you go. God, you're awesome. God, you're great. God, you're kind. Thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for what you're doing. We're going to forgive and we're going to live again because you forgave us initially and you gave us life. Thank you for grace. And God, if there's one here that have not as of yet received your forgiveness, speak to them, Lord. Let them realize that the Son gave his life so they can have life. Draw them to a relationship, God. Draw them to a relationship. Me forgiven is premised in the magnitude of the forgiveness you initially gave me. So God, I repent. And if there's one here that have not yet accepted you into, into their life, let it begin there, God. Let it begin there. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what we're learning. The importance of this little principle, God, to live in the kingdom. Forgive as Christ forgave. We give our hearts and our time to you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 And let me apologize for the time this morning, but just we went over a little bit. Pastor Katani just going to share with us Amen. and allow God Amen. to be God.